hospitals were formed uh, to the rear uh, and in uh, peaceful areas, many of them in uh, the United States, the general hospitals. Uh, and as, as you can see here, the uh, basic idea is long-term care. I'm sorry for the size of the print, but I couldn't get it all on there. <laughs> um, transportation took place in three forms. Trains, hospital ships, and planes. All of those were dangerous. Of the three, the most dangerous were the hospital ships. Three of them were bombed during the war, uh, and um, nurses died as a result of that. Something you may not know about was uh, air evacuation. Air evacuation was very uh, dangerous because air pressure uh, changes as you ascend into, uh, into higher elevations. That means wounds can open. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are uh, the difficulty of what were then called the battle fatigue or battle shock patients, what we call post-traumatic stress patients today. Um, those patients had to be restrained and often medicated because uh, if they weren't, uh, it could cause problems in flight for them and for the other patients. So the nurse in an airplane dealing with the wounded had to general surveil the patients that were there, uh, had to treat any emergencies that might arise, and to keep track of uh, the possibility of any disorder. Sometimes prisoners of war were also transported in the same planes with the wounded, and that caused some severe problems. Uh, one nurse finally said uh, to the, happened to be English, uh, soldiers who were work, uh, wounded, and it was getting quite tense, and the English patients were thinking of, well, let's just throw them out the door, uh, out the window, and uh, the nurse said, hey, wait a minute, these, these men were soldiers too, and that made a difference uh, to, the, uh, to the wounded, that, that calmed them down. Um, but it was, demonstrates the point that the nurse had to be aware not only of medical conditions, but of the environment in which she was working. <clears throat> the uh, air evacuation was quite successful. As you can see there, only 46 patients died out of over a million. That's a, that's a pretty good record, uh, unfortunately, uh, not for the 46. One time there are unexpected events. There's, uh, this happened, this little reference here, uh, happened in the Pacific. The plane went down because they didn't have enough fuel, uh, and it went down on an island. Uh, and uh, one of the patients had a severed windpipe. I don't know how this happened. It was described, not pictured. But the nurse used a uh, breathing tube from a syringe, colonic tubes, and tubes from a life jacket uh, in order to get the man to breathe. Uh, that's a pretty innovative solution. I certainly wouldn't have thought of that. Um, and I'm not sure many people would, but as, uh, that's what was happening in air transport. Uh, so that the structure of operations provided an organizational context in which nurses could then operate successfully. And they did. Uh, additional training also improved organization of the nursing corps. Uh, nurses, of course, had to be trained in military uh, procedure uh, simply because you're dealing with a multi-million man organization and moving people around quickly under dangerous circumstances had to be done in a way that was efficient uh, and um, uh, saved lives and that's certainly in part what that training did. Um, there's also some funny parts. One nurse said the other day I got three demerits for something my boots did. Um, at any rate, um, it was a shock for them to come into that kind of training uh, and, uh, as civilians. You must remember, we're talking about professional people here. Uh, these were not just anybody. These were women who had uh, very specific skills. In addition, uh, nurses were trained in anesthesiology uh, because doctors were needed for other kinds of things, so that uh, activity was delegated to nurses. 
uh, psychiatric nursing because out of uh, one out of every 12 patients required some sort of psychiatric treatment uh, as a result of the war. Finally, something we didn't include in the exhibit, the Cadet Nursing Corps. We didn't include it because it's just too big. Uh, we, we limited this to the Army Nursing Corps, the exhibit itself, but the Cadet Corps was created to supply nurses on the uh, domestic front, uh, the zone of the uh, interior, uh, where uh, nurses served in civilian hospitals for the most part, but sometimes in medical or uh, military hospitals. So all of those provided additional uh, organizational training. And here, I, again, I apologize, it doesn't make your eyes cross to read that. Um, but uh, let me describe quickly what's there. It worked. Um, the uh, uh, 12th uh, unit had to move several times, as you can see there. Uh, in, in the, they landed with the troops in Normandy uh, and were moving across Europe with them. Uh, so they had to be able to set up the, the uh, evacuation hospitals, the field hospitals, and move them on a moment's notice, and then set them up someplace else. Field hospitals were also difficult because often they were places occupied by formerly by the by the enemy uh, in ill repair uh, in North Africa. One unit uh, encountered uh, after landing a hospital they had to create uh, had no electricity, no water, uh, and uh, no beds. Uh, imagine having to cope with all of that as well as wounded uh, at all at the same time. Uh, the uh, 12th moved 11 times in two years uh, as uh, uh, Belafair, who's the author of this little pamphlet, pointed out. The point being that those skills learned in uh, military training, professional skills from nursing school, and simple common sense that exerts itself under the influence of emergency all came together in a nice little package that worked. Um, the, uh, many of the, the men who encountered nurses initially weren't sure that they could perform uh, under the conditions of the field. And uh, in fact, they not only performed, they performed very well. Um, so uh, it worked. It worked in the Pacific as well. Nurses served all over the Pacific, New Zealand, Fiji Islands, New Caledonia, the Hebrides, uh, as well as New Guinea, Guadalcanal, Saipan, Guam, Tinian, uh, and, and other places in, in the South Pacific, in field hospitals. The Pacific was different from, from Europe because of infectious diseases, much more common in the Pacific theater than in the European theater. Uh, and some of that took long-term care. Um, one thing called uh, scrub, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a disease that's encountered from mites uh, and takes a lot of care to uh, get rid of. So it took a lot of labor. In addition to that, uh, there are the problems of security. Um, are, of course, <clears throat> talking about young men overseas uh, who haven't seen uh, many women for a long time. Uh, and nurses, of course, were an attractive uh, target, so to speak. So General MacArthur said, it's better to be safe than sorry, so let's guard them. So they did. Uh, nurses in the Pacific were often under guard, couldn't go out alone, uh, had to have a guard when they went out alone. and. Uh, the nurses' quarters were often uh, off limits. And, and as a result of that, or because of the discipline of the men themselves, no incidents occurred, fortunately. Um, it worked in the Pacific as well. Uh, these are just some examples here. In January of 1943, there were 14,000 some American troops, eight of, uh, almost 9,000 contracted some form of disease, malaria, being the most uh, common, uh, especially in the CBI theater. Um, 
malaria on the front lines of the CVI was uh, often debilitating. As much as 84% of the men who served there contracted malaria. Now, so that required uh, special care, uh, special uniforms. Um, they're, they're quite hot. Uh, in the, is, the temperature is often equivalent to the humidity. Uh, so it, it was quite hot to have to wear those things. Uh, and not everybody did. Uh, the other part of that was to take adabrine. Adabrine turned the skin a kind of yellow-green. Uh, so many uh, nurses said, I'm just not going to take this, and fortunately they didn't contract uh, malaria. <clears throat> the uh, rate went down as a result of those procedures. Overall, then, uh, fewer than 4% of American soldiers who received medical care uh, died. That's uh, unfortunate, of course, but still a pretty good record uh, for any war. Remember, the nursing corps had to be set up immediately. It had to function quickly and efficiently uh, right at the start, in 1941 and 42. Uh, this, for an organization, the United States military, they really didn't quite know what to do with them, but realized, Eisenhower and MacArthur both realized, you simply must be able to care for the wounded effectively, uh, and uh, insisted that it be done efficiently. Um, so organization, professionalism, and courage paid off for the Army Nurse Corps. Uh, there are uh, 1,600 medals there, uh, 201 nurses died as a result of the war, uh, 13 uh, air flight nurses were killed as a result of crashes. Overall, then, uh, what we can say about the Army Nurse Corps and the women who served in it is uh, they were soldiers, too. They were warriors, too, just like the men on the battlefield. But as you saw in the, in the newsreel films, none of that was recognized at the time. Um, and again, it's the title of our exhibit, We Didn't Do Anything, because that's what the culture said about these women. But in fact, without them, many, many, many men would have died, uh, and others suffered terribly as a result uh, of injury. So uh, tonight, we commemorate them with this exhibit. As you walk down the hall here, this hall in, in back of you, all of the war time posters, there are about a dozen of them, are on the walls. Uh, take a look at them. <clears throat> They're really quite good. Uh, then uh, we have the, the nurse's prayer, and in the, the back uh, of the atrium here is the exhibit itself, where we have running in sync the uh, Defense Department's Army Nursing Training Film from 1945. So part it's broken down into um, boot camp, uh, shipping out, uh, and various theaters. Uh, there are other things that are back there that are worth seeing, uh, so I invite you to take your time to visit the exhibit uh, and read what we've put up there. It is unique. No one else in the United States has done this kind of an exhibit. And here in Muskegon at the Suicides Museum we have, and, and that's certainly a great thing. Uh, this is a great place uh, for uh, what we're trying to do, which is to honor and commemorate the uh, men and women who served in... Am I what? Somebody whistle? Did I hear that? Is that the microphone? It must have been the microphone. Maybe it's my hearing aid. I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, the museum commemorates and honors those veterans, and I hope you will find the exhibit uh, one that uh, enlightens you and inspires you. Thank you for your attention and good evening. Okay, who's got a whistle in their pocket? Question. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Barb Clark Flores, who's not in World War II, but did serve in the nurse corps since that time. And she's moved back to Muskegon since she and her husband. Uh, well, he retired, and she's still working for him. Please stand, Barb. Welcome back. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I was also going to ask other nurses who are in the audience, men or women, 
Would you please stand? We need to thank you for what you do. Would you please stand? Thank you. 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 And thank you for coming to this exhibit. Commercial. Upcoming events. Sometimes it's hard to get the word out there. Well, let me tell you, we try. We do put things in the Chronicle. We do a lot of them through social media. So we ask you just to pass on the word. March, the Tuskegee Airmen exhibit will open. We will also be having a dinner honoring veterans and presentation of the Dr. Robert Garrison Award. Uh, Monday, December 8th, a few weeks away, Voices of a Never Ending Done, and talking about the men known as the polar bears from the end of World War I. And then when you ever drive over the causeway north of Muskegon, you will see a polar bear at either end of the causeway. And you will uh, hear more about that story. There's my colleague Jeff. I didn't even see you here before. Hello, Jeff. Good evening to you. Thank you for coming. And uh, the uh, spring lecture series kind of begins on February 16th. That may not be very springy, but that's when we're starting that series. And then in February, a play, a drama, a piece of my heart, a, dr a true drama of six women who went to Vietnam. I've seen, this play was put on in uh, Holland. I've seen the video. It's pretty compelling, pretty sad, pretty dramatic, but that will take place in uh, yeah, February. There are other things that are going on here, some to which, many of which are invited, but I don't know whether any of you would care to come to a dance which we're going to host here for the Muskegon Catholic Central High School here at Christmas at time. And then a, uh, a military ball we're working on with the ROTC from the junior ROTC from Muskegon High School. We hope that'll be around the beginning of uh, March. So uh, we're, we're just moving on, moving on, moving on. I want to turn this over to my colleague because she is going to invite a couple of the special guests here tonight to do the ribbon cutting as we move down this hallway. So Pink, would you like to come forward and take over here? I would like to ask our two honored guests tonight to please cut the ribbon and open the exhibit for all the rest of us. And then once you've had a chance to wander through the exhibit, please come back and help yourself to some refreshments. The ribbon cutting will be taking place right by the wall of posters. So please take a look as we cut our ribbon. It's in there now? 